we have struggled, we have feared. We have doubted God is near. We have run from love's embrace. Made a mockery of God's grace. We have shame and refuse to take the blame, but there's no silence anymore. We will seek forgiveness, reconciled, restored. We will be church alive again in Christ. We will spread good news, invite all those inside. Who've been broken down, made lesser than, so God can make all whole again. We will be a light for everyone to We will be the church our God calls us to be. We will cast out hate and greed. When creation is in need, respect and cherish everyone. God's reign of love will come. We will be the church alive again in Christ. We will spread the news and fight all those inside. us from our doubt and shame. We seek your love, we need your grace, we need your spirit in this place. So we will be the church alive again in Christ. We will spread good news, invite all those inside. Broken down, made lesser than, so you can make a whole again. We will be a light for everyone to see. We will be the church that you call us to be. We will be the church alive again in Christ. We will spread the news. the church that you call us to be. Welcome to Church of the Apostles, where we now worship virtually. And we give thanks that you have chosen to make us part of your faith journey. So, just a few announcements as we begin. First, Happy Father's Day to all of those of you who are fathers, grandfathers, caretakers, adopted fathers, whatever um, mode of 
of parenting you are doing. We give thanks today for all parents. And so just a special, we have a special treat um, for, for some of our fathers in, a little bit later in the program. Also, if you go to our website on the announcement page, there are some uh, resource sheets and some ideas for the children to do with having to do with Father's Day and a, a story about some, a father. And so I invite you to look into that and, and see if that might be something that might be helpful to you. The other announcement that I wanted to make is um, for those of you who are still wrapped up or, or caught, feeling called to do something about um, all of the racial injustice that we have been experiencing in the protests, there's going to be another prayer vigil. This time it will be on Thursday in Columbia at the Borough Hall. Uh, from 4 to 5 p.m. So this Thursday, June 25th, uh, from 4 to 5. If you need any other information, please feel free to contact me. I'm going to be there. I've got my sign that I made for the Penn Square rally, and I'm, I'm going back out um, for another, another vigil. Today, our theme is called Walking in God's Truth as we explore Genesis 21 and Psalm 86. These are difficult scriptures to read. Psalm 86 almost sounds like the words of those from the Black Lives Matter movement or maybe the words of Hagar that come at, the, who is a character in our Genesis 21 scripture. Because in Genesis 21, it seems that jealousy gets to rule the day. But jealousy isn't one of those characteristics that God hopes that we will carry out. And so, we invite you into this conversation, into this reflection today. And as we begin, we always like to begin with a centering breath. So if you would take a nice deep breath in with me. And then exhale all of the worries, the grief, the anxiety that you're holding. And give that all to God. Because God wants it. God not, can, can not only just hold it, but God wants all of that. He wants to take that from us, that we can feel real peace. And during our next song, we invite you to light a candle in whatever way is safest where you are to show that the presence of Christ is with you just as it is with us in this space and time. Let us worship our God. psalmist names that the Lord has the power to make life worth living. God is worthy of our prayers because God answers them. Our God is awesome 
a miracle worker. So we gather in God's worship to be called anew by God as we stop, look, and listen for the author of life who is calling to us. Let us pray. Living God, we enter this time of worship for we feel you calling to us and urging us to be a part of your family. We stand with all people gathered in hopeful community, choosing to be a place where your generosity and kindness dwell. Amen.
God's faithfulness has been present from the beginning. It is our agendas that drift away from who God has called us to be. And so here in this place, made holy by God and by our intention to be known by God, the word comes to heal and redeem. Together, let us open our lives to the Holy One. Let us pray. Lord, listen closely to me and answer me, because I am poor and in need. My selfishness and fears stop me from living as you would have me to do. Save your servant who trusts in you, you, my God. Have mercy on me, Lord, because I cry out to you all day long. Teach me your way, Lord, so that I can walk in your truth. We come seeking your wisdom to be vital and authentic in our lives. Make my heart focused only on honoring your name. I give thanks to you, my Lord, my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify your name forever. Amen. Our God is very patient and full of faithful love. Pay attention to your life and see the signs of God's work, God's abundant blessings. Thanks be to God. Amen. friends. Uh, it's been a while since I've last preached, but today I want to share with you a story that I wrote. Uh, as I was thinking about you all and the time that we gather in the front and you all come down and you're dancing and you're laughing and you're asking questions, uh, I really started to miss that. So in thinking of you, I wrote a story uh, it was actually supposed to be like a 500-word reflection, and then it just turned into a story. And it's based upon a line I heard during one of my classes that the best leaders are those that step into the seas with the people. So this story is about a little tugboat that could. I think that one's already written. <laughs> But there was a beautiful little village on the seacoast with a great big harbor. This harbor had a great marina and all sorts of boat stock here. Short ones, fancy wood ones, fast ones, 
Great big shiny ones with helicopters on their decks. Tall ones, heavy equipment boats. And the most common, small little fishing boats. But tucked way in the back of the harbor, almost forgotten, was a rusty, crusty tugboat. It was rusty from all the years that the water has splashed on its exterior. It was crusty because all the slime and grime from the years of barnacles that stuck to it. Many years before these new boats were around, this was the best tugboat in all the harbor. In those days, the big sail ships needed help getting into the harbor. And that was a majestic sight. To see all these ships coming into the harbor with fancy uh, rails and ropes everywhere. And the frantic hustle and bustle around them to load their cargo. The big ships sailed in those days. They owned the harbor. But not anymore. Things have changed. The big ships don't come to dock at this harbor anymore. Now technology and knowledge has advanced. So has the harbor. These days, the old tugboat just sits in the back, almost forgotten. These new boats, they don't need to be tugged. They have technology and are so advanced that they could do it all on their own. Fancy sonars and computer guides them where they are to go. Wherever the old tugboat leaves its dock, the new tugboats laugh and mock it for all the rust and crust on the old tugboat. Where are you going? You are so old. There's something wrong with your color. You are really old. You're falling apart. You are very, very old, is all that the tugboat would hear. The new boats purposely pushed the crusty and rusty tugboat aside. But that day, three boats left the harbor to chase the sun as it was setting far into the sea. There was a small one, a fast one, and a big boat. And they all rushed right past the rusty, crusty tugboat on their way out to sea. The old tugboat remembered the beauty of the sunset and also went out to sea. The tugboat continued out on its own in its constant pace and arrived just in time to see the most beautiful and majestic of all sunsets. Oranges and reds and purples filled the sky. And the boats just floated along in the sea, taking in all the beauty to behold. Suddenly, a great big storm swept in. Its big waves began to crash into the boats. The fast boat quickly heads back to the harbor, leaving them all behind. The big boat, with its powerful engine, breaks through the waves and returns to the safety of the harbor, leaving the small boat out in the sea. The terrible storm has caught the boat in a surge. The big waves just taking advantage of this small little ship, tossing it around as the waves will it. Rain is coming down, lightning and thunder strike all around, while the little boat is just struggling and fighting to make it back to the harbor. It's trying with all its strength and might to make it on its own, but it can't. As night falls, it realizes that it's on its own, And it does not have enough power to make it back to the harbor. By itself, it can't change the situation. Hope has abandoned this little boat. Meanwhile, back at the harbor, the ships discuss, who's going to go out there? Who can go out there? The fast boat tells the other boats. If only the small boat was fast like me, then it wouldn't still be in the storm. The big boat yells out, too bad that small boat wasn't as powerful as me, then it wouldn't still be in the storm. Then the boats in the harbor begin to talk about the small boat and what it could have done to be better, what it could have done to avoid that storm. As the boats have their meeting, 
to start implementing new strategies and brainstorm ideas about how not to get stuck in the storms, they forget that the small boat is still out in the sea. But the tugboat didn't forget. The tugboat remained at its constant speed, heading directly to that small little boat. The whole time the small boat was being tossed by the waves, it sees the old tugboat in the distance. It says, what are you doing here? You are old. You are rusty. You are crusty. You can't help me. Oh, but the tugboat responds, don't worry about me. I've seen plenty of storms. Hold on to this rope and I'll guide you in. With its old faithful tow line attached to the small boat, it turns towards the harbor. The waves and the storm continue to rage, but that rusty, crusty tugboat maintained its speed and direction. The small boat was filled with fear. Can't you go faster? cried out the small boat. Can't you break through the waves? pleaded the small boat. I am a tugboat. All I know is how to bring boats back into the harbor, responded the tugboat. After fighting through the storm all night long, the two boats arrived safely in the harbor. And to their surprise, the welcoming that they received was an inquisition. What are you doing here? cried out the boats in the harbor. That's not the way things are done. We were planning on how to rescue the small boat from the storm. You've ruined our plans, you rusty, crusty tugboat. You must go. You're no longer welcome in this harbor. Feeling rejected once again, the old, rusty, crusty tugboat headed to its dock, way in the back of the harbor. Wait, yelled the small boat. The old tugboat was in the sea with me while you all left me behind. You were so busy in the safety of the harbor, planning, strategizing, forgetting about me in the storm. The rusty, crusty tugboat stayed with me and pulled me in. Everyone had forgotten what the tugboat could do. It did its job. Its job was to bring boats to the harbor. One by one, the boats realized that they needed the rusty and crusty tugboat in the harbor. Working together was the way for all the boats to survive. Even though they're very different, everyone has a seat, a place, and a voice in the harbor. When the other boats needed help, the rusty and crusty tugboat still continued to do its job. It keeps going out into the sea to bring boats back in. That's all it had done and could do, and that's all it would do. So the story about this little boat, we can all be different characters in this story. We can be the tugboat, we can be the small boat, we can be the fast boat. So at different times in our lives, we are any of those boats. So my prayer is that we realize what our role is and how our role affects other people. Thank you.
The covenant established through Sarah and Abraham is one founded in a relationship filled with joys and disappointments, struggles and celebrations. In this we are invited to stop, to look and to listen for who God is and who we are and to the life we are called to share in together. Let us listen for how the Spirit of God is working to bring life in Genesis, chapter 21, verses 8 through 21. The boy, Isaac, the one conceived by God through Abraham and Sarah, grew and stopped nursing. On the day he stopped nursing, Abraham prepared a huge banquet. Sarah saw Hagar's son laughing, the one Hagar the Egyptian had born to Abraham. So she said to Abraham, send this servant away with her son. This servant's son won't share the inheritance with my son Isaac. This upset Abraham terribly because the boy was his son. God said to Abraham, don't be upset about the boy and your servant. Do everything Sarah tells you to do because your descendants will be traced through Isaac. But I will make of your servant's son a great nation too because he also is your descendant. Abraham got up early in the morning, took some bread and a flask of water and gave it to Hagar. He put the boy in her shoulder sling and sent her away. She left and wandered through the desert near Beersheba. Finally, the water in the flask, it ran out. And she put the boy down under one of the desert shrubs. She walked away. She walked away from him about as far as a bow shot and sat down telling herself, I can't bear to see the boy die. She sat at a distance, cried out in grief and wept. God heard the boy's cries. And God's messenger called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, Hagar, what's wrong? Don't be afraid. God has heard the boy's cries over there. Get up, pick up the boy and take him by the hand because I will make of him a great nation. Then God opened her eyes. And she saw the well. She went over, filled the water flask, and gave the boy a drink. God remained with the boy. He grew up, lived in the desert, and became an expert archer. He lived in the Paran Desert, and his mother found him an Egyptian wife. Holy words, holy wisdom, thanks be to God. So it seems that today we're living in a Hollywood disaster movie and this line, this plot line is still developing. The events that are surrounding us today have set our lives apart from everything else we've ever experienced. Hopefully we'll look back on years to come and wonder if the events of 2020 fit into the grand scheme of life or is just some abnormality to be remembered. In the same way, this chapter, this section actually weaves three tales together. It first focuses in on Isaac and his early life as the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham and and Sarah. And we even have a celebration But then in verse 9, this narrative changes, and so do the characters. And the verse that I want to focus in on is, But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian. 
And then this tale begins to center around two other characters, which end in verse 21. So this whole tale talks about racism and oppression, entitlement, gender, ethnicity, class, patriarchy, feminist, womanist, and the colonial narrative. This struggle, this tension pulls every character in every other way. We see the main one, that of being Ishmael. Because in the entirety of this section, he's never named. He's referred to by his identity, the son of the slave woman, the son of Abraham. He remains anonymous. Even God names him as the son of Abraham. Never does he have a name. Until verse 21, when he's an adult. See, we see the interaction between two different characters in the beginning, between Sarah and Hagar. And as Sarah notices what's happening, some versions do say, they notice Hagar, that she noticed Hagar's son laughing. And maybe in some weird helicopter, snowplow parent uh, move, she realized that she needed to fight for her son and for his inheritance and for his storyline and for his lifeline to continue. Even though they were promised by God who Isaac was going to be. But Sarah, a woman living in a patriarch society, always being told what to do by Abraham. She submits on different occasions to Abraham's desires. Say that you're my sister. Don't tell him who you really are. Because the whole time, Abraham was just trying to take care of himself. But that's another story for another week. Actually, next week, Pastor Kuhn, she'll address that. So I'll just leave that there. <laughs> but to talk about identity and to talk about your role and to talk about who you are in society, we could take a look at any of these characters. You know, often Hagar is the villain. I know a lot of Sarahs. I don't know any Hagar's. But the thing is, in this narrative, Hagar's the victim. Hagar, the Egyptian slave, submits to her owner. Without a say, she does what she's told. Sarah has her lay with her husband. She doesn't have a choice. She doesn't have an opinion. She cannot say no. Hagar is the oppressed. And then in this society where slaves are worse than uh, children, the child of a slave has been elevated to the heir. And then this nomadic society where the firstborn gets everything. Sarah becomes scared for her son. Because the law protects Ishmael. Sarah is afraid for her son. Sarah does not believe the promise of God that says that their son would be the one to inherit. So she must act in desperation, in jealousy, in fear. She puts her own comfort and the life of her son ahead of someone else. But Abraham, the man of faith, right? The patriarch of the Hebrews. This man so revered that he's even mentioned in the New Testament. Folds. And instead of using his authority to do the right thing. He goes to God pleading as if he didn't know what to do. 
He has two sons. What is the right thing to do? And here even God addresses Ishmael by his identity. See, identity is really important in the Bible. If you read the genealogies, you see whose son was whose, whose father was whose. And even in the New Testament during Jesus' baptism, we see that God himself gave Jesus an identity. This is my son, who I am proud. And Jesus hadn't even done anything yet, so... But Hagar and Ishmael were pushed away. There was something different about them. They were Egyptian. They weren't the ones of the promise. So they weren't even allowed to live. They weren't allowed to be part of the community. They must be sent away. They must be kept in their role. And as Hagar and Ishmael wander in the desert, she cries out. And this is where we would insert the psalm, Psalm 86. And these could be her very own words as she cries out in desperation, in fear, in the chaos, in the unknown. But God answers. But God answers Ishmael and his cry. At no point does he answer Hagar. And God, being truthful to his promise, the promise that he made Abraham in Genesis, the promise of the children, like the grains of sand, He continues that promise with Ishmael. You see, there's a weird plot twist here where someone who is despised becomes blessed. He was living with his father in the blessing, rightfully the heir to all that was supposed to be inherited from Abraham. But God had other plans. And the come Sunday, I alluded to Sarah as the villain. But the truth is, we see her as a hero. Here, villains and heroes in our story are, are very fluid roles. But I see Sarah as a woman in desperation, doing the best that she could in that circumstance with the little power and influence that she had because she was a woman and she just did the best she could. And here we have this story where once the collateral damage settles, only a miracle can save the innocent. Only God stepping into the humanity. We have these two people wandering a desert. And God creates a people from them. These people without an identity. They're referred to as slaves. They're known for their worth. They're known for their value. But God sees their real value. God sees their lineage. God sees whose children they are. And he fulfills his promise. I think, and this is where I'm going to bring Paul in, this is where we give Hagar a bad name. Because in Galatians, Paul refers to the story in an allegory. 
He calls Sarah's son the son of freedom. And he calls Hagar's son the son of slavery. But if you study Paul, you see that Paul clearly refers to the law as slavery. And that would make Isaac the son of slavery. And then years later, you know, 2,000 years of church history, many writers, many authors, many trees were killed. Hagar is our villain. Ishmael is the villain trying to take away Isaac's inheritance. And the seeds and residual effect can still be felt to this day. The Middle East is an area of great difficulty, with great division, because humanity was at its best one day. This is a story that we can write ourselves into. At any point in this story, we could have been any of those characters. We could have been Abraham and had an opportunity to stand up and do the right thing. Or we could have been Sarah, felt uncomfortable, felt this tension, but needed to look out for ourselves. We could have been Ishmael, just tossed around by society, by the system, by social standards. Because all you wanted to do, Ishmael, was have fun. All you wanted to do was laugh. And now you found yourself in the desert, crying out to God. Or maybe we're Hagar. And society tells us what our life is to be. But as the church, we have a voice. As a church, we have the identity. The UCC church has the right lineage. The UCC church has the right influence. We could trace our history back to the Protestant days. How do we use that influence? How do we use the power? When there's other people hurting. When there's other people suffering. Are we Abraham? Are we Sarah? May it be so. Let us pray. In this time of polarizing tensions, sickness and health, racial, civil, political, and social divide, in this time of need and this time of greed, in life and in death, in comfort and in pain, You, Lord, hold it all together in the palm of your hand. Help us to see you in new ways. Help us to celebrate joy during this season. We are thankful for the most beautiful music and worship. We're happy for the restaurant's efforts to create new ways of dining. We are hopeful in the things that are happening in the city. We're glad for the beautiful weather and the birds singing. We thank you, God, for the joys of this community. In this same space, we also recognize that the concerns are a part of life, and we name them to you. As a community, we intercede for those that are voiceless, powerless, hurting, and hopeless. You, Lord, hear our concerns. We pray for the Ebersol's friend, Katie, Glenn's doctor's cousin, Teresa Wilson's friend, Babs, 
and Carol Horn. As your children, we come to you, O oh God. You have given us your identity as your children. And we pray to you in the manner which your son Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we focus our hearts on honoring God, as we consider the ways in which we have been blessed, may we direct a portion of our blessings to God and to God's church. As we encourage others, as we join in partnership within this world, to be a blessing to others and to allow our blessedness to be the joy of others. We ask that you mail your checks to the church office at 1850 Marietta Avenue in Lancaster, or you can go online to apostlesucc.org and visit our donate page where you can give online that way. Also on Fridays from 10 to 2 p.m., we continue to receive donations of food and hygiene supplies as a way to bless people in this community and to share the love, the grace, and the blessing that is of our God. Thank you. 
up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. The rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. come to you let my heart be changed renewed loving from your grace that I find in you and Lord I've come to know the weaknesses I see in me will be stripped away in the power of your love Hold me close Let your love surround me Bring me near Draw me to your side And as I wait I'll rise up like a Hey! 